question I get every now and then is, is there really such a thing as the psychology of golf or simply golf psychology? And if there is such a thing called golf psychology, is it really any different than the basic tenets in mental skills training or regular sport psychology? So in this little mini session, I'm going to try to give you the differences, the compare and contrast, if you would, into specific golf psychology as opposed to regular sport psychology. Now, many of the things that I use with clients in other sports are very similar. In fact, some of them are exactly the same as used in golf, but the sport of golf is so cognitive. You have to, there's so much goes on in the mind from when you arrive to the golf course until you leave. In fact, it keeps, for a lot of my clients, it keeps grinding on them. Even, you know, a lot, any hours, days, months, and even years after they leave the golf course. And that's part of the problem of golf, of golf psychology. And that's why a lot of my clients are, are uh, golf centered. And that's just the nature of the game. I mean, I, I've played golf for so many years. I know how once you get hooked into the game, that's one of the old adages of golf is that once you're hooked, you're hooked. And part of the reason is, is because of the challenge of the game is such that it really takes a toll on you. If you're competitive, that is, it really, t it can take a toll on you psychologically. And I think part of the reason why golf has hooked so many players is that you get a, a great sense of satisfaction at once you worked on something for a period of time and then all of a sudden it pays off for you on the golf course. You get a great sense of self-satisfaction in that. Uh, whereas I don't know if you get that same satisfaction. I mean, I think some athletes do, but in the game of golf, because it's so personal, I mean, it's just you and the ball and the equipment and that's it. And you're alone on this island. Unlike when you're in a team sport, you often hear players uh, thank their teammates after a great victory. When golf, is, there is no team. Uh, you're on your own. And so that when you do get some positive feedback from the game, at least for myself and from the clients that I've worked with that uh, play serious golf, the satisfaction they get is just, uh, it's wonderful. It's just a wonderful feeling. And part of the reason why it's such a wonderful feeling is because the satisfaction you get out of the game can sometimes be reflected back on your expectations, your perhaps even your self-image. If you have built this image of yourself as a scratch player or a terrific tournament player or forget about being a professional golfer. I mean, that is, that's a whole different subject there. That's a level three player. And I'll talk about that in a second, but as just a very good amateur, you know, the thing is paying off now. All the lessons you've taken and the equipment that you've purchased and all the time and energy that you've sunk into this game, it now has paid off. And then what you get back out of it it really reflects, or it can reflect back onto your self-image, how you see yourself. I have worked hard on this game, and then, and yet here it is, it's paying off for me. It's a great feeling. Problem is that a lot of players, and I don't know if I can say this confidently, but majority of players, they don't get that satisfaction. And that is why the game is so, uh, so challenging. Let me just put it that way. Let me put that... Let me phrase that in a very kind way. The game is very challenging to the majority of players because the game of golf doesn't owe you anything. And that's part of the problem. I have spent all this money on equipment. Uh, the television commercial said I had to hit the ball further. And all these lessons I'm taking, I should be doing better. Whereas the game of golf doesn't owe you anything. You go into the game with that kind of attitude that you deserve uh, to be a better player than you are, ain't gonna happen. And so this kind of a backwards thinking I have put in, therefore I deserve to get out, it does not work in this game. And so that's why the game is so frustrating to a lot of people. And that's part of the separation between 
the psychology of golf, and then the psychology of a lot of other sports. So I'll go into it a little bit right now. In mental skills training, one, some of the tenets, some of the fundamental basic tenets can be used to improve a person's game of golf. But quite frankly, this is one of the reasons why the handicaps have not gone down or have gone down very little over the last 50 years. Uh, if you go back and look at the data, the handicaps back in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, they're about the same as they are right now. And I've, done, I've read a couple of studies online that say that over the last 15 or 20 years, handicaps may have dropped by two strokes on average per round. Other data stats suggest that handicaps have not dropped down any since the 50s. Ever since the handicaps have, been, have started to be recorded, the average handicap has not dropped any. Now, there are a lot of reasons why uh, a lot of people don't keep a handicap. The influx in and out of players, uh, and a lot of players have quit the game over the last few years because of expense and time, so forth and so on. The game ha has been bloated since the influx of Tiger, and now it's being thinned out again. So there's a lot of reasons why. However, my whole thing about golf handicaps are that mo the, the, the ones that I've had experience with when playing in so-called um, uh, handicap tournaments, I'd be like the fourth guy in there, big broad in, and there's always a, a sandbagger in there, seems like they always have uh, a higher handicap than they really do. And then you have other players that simply don't keep a handicap. They don't want you to know what their handicap is because they, quite frankly, you know, they don't take the game all that seriously. So handicapping, uh, whether or not the data is accurate or not, it might be, it might not be, but my thoughts were, as far as handicapping is concerned, is concerned and people improving, they haven't really improved. Not at all, it seems like, to me anyway. And it can't be equipment, right? Because look at the advances from those clubs there to the clubs of today. Look at the look at the ball technology. Look at all of the lessons and the where where instruction has come from the '50s all the way up to now. I mean, we've got gurus that have written book after book after book, videos online about how to hit a golf ball, so on and so on. And yet, all of this has not affected the handicaps at all. And you know what hasn't? evolved over time is mental skills training. So when you had players back in the 40s and the 50s, the Hogans and the Sneeds, these are guys who just grinded it out like a Hogan or in Sneed or, Ho hey, uh, or in, like with Sam Sneed who had just such a great natural ability. They were just naturally gifted with the hand to eye coordination and balance that they just went and they had the sieve of talent. They just went up to the top. Of course, they had opportunity and the money and the talent to do that as well, the opportunity certainly. But the rest of the players, they, they there's no way, they can't make a living playing this game, so it was only open to a very small portion of people. What's so baffling to me nowadays is that now the game uh, over the last, say, 20 years has been opened up, to sp certainly to the professional golfer, and yet most professional golfers on the mini tour of the uh, LPGA developmental tours, they'll never make it. And it's just the same old pattern. The lessons, the equipment, everything, it's the same thing, even with that level three player, level three being the single digit or the professional player. They don't, they don't work on their mental game. They, have, they, they really don't know what to work on or they don't want to work on their game because uh, they don't want anyone messing around with their mind. There's so many misconceptions with sports psychology uh, and what the service of sports psychology offers that, you know, people don't really understand it. So because they don't understand it, they have a fear of it. And because they have a fear of it, they, they just sort of shun that thing, went, shun that thing out. When I was in graduate school, I worked with a college team there, had never been worked with before. And uh, the coach there on that particular team told me to my face that he thought sports psychology was voodoo. Now, he had been the coach there for over 20 years and had no success in 20 years. He had no success with that team. When I got there, I worked with the players not only on their swing, but on their psychology of why they're swinging that way. What is the basis of the decisions that they're making on the golf courses, their course management? And then all of a sudden, the, the fundamentals of the game 
or of at least sports psychology is emotional regulation, visualization, self-talk, and literally the breathing aspects of mental skill training. All of a sudden, we've got two or three players that now have per, have taken this team to the bottom of their division. All of a sudden, they're going to the NCAA championships. Now, I can't take credit for that, but my thought my thoughts were these players had never been exposed to mental skills training in their entire life. All they needed was to have somebody care about the way they were thinking around the golf course, not just the swing, but it was why they were swinging this way. Why were they making these particular decisions on these particular days? And then going back and analyzing those decisions, I wasn't trying to help them swing the golf club in particularly, even though that sometimes they would ask me because I had been, I've been a golf instructor for 30 years. So point though is that I was the, I was the guy, I was the why guy behind the what. And so some of those guys that just blossomed and that's the same thing that I see today. And lots of LPGA developmental tour players will never make it to their goal. They will, they will never ever achieve their goal because they do not understand the full, they don't understand what it takes to become an LPGA or a PGA player. They may think they know, but living in this kind of denial is the kinds of things that keeps a player from fulfilling their goal. I want to give you an example. I want you to watch this clip from Faraday on what Greg Norman said. If Now, they're talking about Greg Norman, the Tiger Woods of the 80s and the 90s. And Faraday asked Greg, if you could go back and do something different or you regret something, what would you do differently? Listen to what Norman had to say. Um, I tried to do it all myself. I had a great coach, and Charlie up early on, and then Butch Harmon, and little David Ledbetter, and a little bit of Jim McLean. And, but I, I, um, I really didn't have anybody else. Uh, I, I would have brought in a sports psychologist, mm -hmm. because quite honestly, today I recognize the fact that I needed it then. Mm -hmm. When I was there, then I'm going, a sports psychologist, he doesn't know what, what it feels like to stand there, 188 out, uphill yeah. shot, 872nd hole at Augusta. He's never done it. So how's he going to tell me what to do, right? Yeah. Well, it wasn't that. It's how you pre prepare yourself for that shot. Right. And um, so I would definitely have done that. So what did Greg say? If he could roll the clock back, 35 years, what would he do differently? That's this is Greg Norman talking about here now. Guy that's won over 80 events worldwide. And we all know about the Norman snake bite things that happened to him over time. But what did Greg say? It wasn't about it wasn't about how to hit the ball. He just didn't think anyone could relate to where he was coming from. Just because somebody with a PhD did not play the game, does that mean they can't tell or, or help Greg understand the motives behind his game, behind the motivation behind, these, behind his decision making? But Greg was wrong now. Greg is wrong now because there is a person who has a, an advanced doctorate in sports psychology who did play professional golf, who is a golf instructor for the last 30 years, who is an inventor of 15 golf training aids, who is a published author of golf instruction book and academic papers, and who is a current tournament player, and that'd be me. So there is one person in this whole world that I am aware of that has those credentials. So. Yes, and it is important that the person you're working with can relate to your sport, but it is not 100% necessary. It's just that if you want to go down the golf rabbit hole, as I say, the so-called golf psychology, you need to have somebody on your team who at least understands what the game, what you're facing psychologically with a three-foot putt, left to right slider, left edge, down grain, or something like that. You need to have somebody that can at least talk that language so that you can relate to that person. And I think maybe that's been one of the, let's say one of the firewall decisions of players, just like what Norman said. You can't understand where I'm coming from because you've never been where I am. Well, that's not true. Now, granted, most people, not if, if perhaps all 
sports psychology consultants or sports psychologists, they may fit into that category. But that excuse now is over. You got your instructor, that's fine. Just like Norman said, you need to have somebody to help you with, with your golf swing. There's plenty of golf instructors out there, all kinds of golf instructors out there. But those people are just the A, B, and C guys, right? They're just the, you know, the, the take away, the backswing, and so forth and so on, the transition. What about the guy that's the why guy? Why am I hitting this shot? What's the decision making behind this shot? What is my motivation about this particular golf club? The decision making. Why am I hitting this shot right now? And is there a better way to hit this shot? That's where a guy like me comes in. So with that, they, what I have identified, there are three golf minds, three levels, if you would, of the golf mind. And the first level is the range mind. So the range mind is where you work with your golf instructor. Have you ever noticed that you a player will be on a lesson and they're doing great in, with their instructor standing right there? As soon as that person leaves, they, you know, they return back to where they were. And the reason is, is because that person, that instructor is acting as your sports psychology consultant right there, even though this is not about sports psychology. That person is telling you what to do, how to hit a golf shot. When you leave, when that instructor leaves and that person now, they're on their own, well, the safety net now is gone. And many times, if not most of the time, they'll revert, revert back to where they were. The game of golf requires a lot of rote memory over and over and over again in order, in order, in order to cement or embed into the long-term procedural memory cells in your mind. There is no such thing as muscle memory. Muscle has no memory cells. It is through repetition. Some say even there's a study out that said it's 10,000 hours to make a change and then inform it into a habit. I'm not sure if that's 100% correct because if a person uses mental skills training like visualization or feedback, from even a camera, even a visual feedback from a camera. Or you add the third element in there, you got the feedback from the camera, visual feedback from the camera, you have an auditory feedback from your golf instructor, and then you're also seeing it in your mind, you're visualizing it in your mind. I don't know if it would take 10,000 hours to create a new habit, but let's just say if it did, how many balls how, how long does it take to hit a bucket of balls out there? 30 minutes? So then you add in how many hours, how many buckets of balls is it going to take me to get to 10,000 hours? You know, no, I, I'm not 100% sure that I can fully get on board with the 10,000 hour sort of hypothesis, but let's just say if it, it was half of that, say 5,000 hours, how much time is that student going to be able to commit to those particular changes, you see? And so you... As a golf instructor, you have to get that player on that level one player, get him going on the right track right away. However, from the swings that I have seen on the driving range, the level one player has not taken any lessons because if they have taken lessons, they certainly wouldn't be holding the club or swinging the club like they are. Where are they getting this idea about swinging the club like they are? Where are they getting their information from, you see? And so this is where somebody like me could come into play for them, but I would, I would think that the first step would be to go and see a qualified instructor to get them to understand this is how you hold a golf club. This is literally what the grip feels like or looks like. This is the takeaway, this is the backswing, and this is the down, this is the initiation of the downswing, and so forth and so on. So, but many of the players I see, that's just your whacking balls. So, and they're looking for an immediate feedback and they're getting an immediate feed, getting a negative immediate feedback. So they're being negatively reinforced. So the game is negative to them right from the get go, right from the get go, it's becoming negative. Why don't they take a lesson then? I don't know now that I really don't know why a beginner does not take a lesson. Maybe they feel like it's too expensive. Maybe they don't want to invest that kind of money into their game. They're not, you know, they're not there yet. So that's why I call that a player as just a level one player. 
because they're at the very beginning of it. Now they go out and whack a few balls. Maybe they go and drink some beer on a course and have fun with their buddies. And that's just a recreational player, and that's fine. I guess that's what we need. So what, what can we say? It's got nothing to do with my crowd because my crowd are the level three player. But for the level one player, the player just beginning, they're out there at the top golf. And they're having a blast doing it. And thank goodness for the top golf. I guess that, you know, they are growing the game of golf. But they, you know, that is uh, that is for a recreational player. Seemingly, it seems like it's for a recreational player. It looks like it's, it's just a giant video game. But my point, my point is, is that where are they getting their information from? This is where, this is the thing that I've always thought. Is it coming from, you know, golf instruction books of, you know, how, how are they learning how to hang on to the club? Where is this information uh, impacting them? And, and, the, and then they go out on the course for a few weeks or a few months. And then by that time, they may have already passed the 10,000 hour rule. And they've, they've been holding the grip wrong since day one. So then we go to, like I said, to a level two player. Now they've come from the range and now they're interested in a practice round because we're assuming now this player now is a tournament player. So they go from the range that wrote, wrote that wrote kind of memory onto you know a, a practice round. The 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 cognition between the two are so different. And you ever wonder why? players complain that I can do well on the range, but I can't take it on the golf course. It's because they don't have this, the, the decision making, it's totally different. The decisions and the things that go on on the driving range are very different than the thought processes that happen in a round of golf, even in a practice round of golf, but they don't switch. The brain doesn't switch. It stays in practice mode, in rotation or rote uh, in the rote mode, R-O-T-E, rote, just over and over again. And there's absolutely no consequences. So they hit a bad shot, just put another ball down there. Problem is, is that when you get on the golf course, unless you're out there by yourself just whacking away mulligans, if you are in a foursome, certainly with people that you don't know, you can't just keep dropping balls down there until you get it right. So then now there's become this little thing called pressure, I guess if that's what you want to call it. What it really is, is situational anxiety. That's what it is. Because now there are circumstances. And if you hit a, a bad shot here, you have to pay the price. There's a circumstance here. And so that causes anxiety. So if you are one of these players that have just been on the driving range, hitting ball after ball after ball after ball, with no, you know, you hit a bad shot and just drop another one down there and you try to take that type of mentality onto the golf course in a practice round and that's the reason why you're not doing any good. If you can't transition, that's the reason why. You did not get out of the rope mode. You're still there. You didn't come over here into the golf, playing the golf mind. And so there's the second level of golf psychology is the decision making. And then how do I get from position A, T, to position B, fairway or green? How do I get there? And why am I choosing this club? Why am I choosing this shot? Where do I want to miss this? What's a good place to miss if I have to bail out here? All of these decisions are absent on the driving range, you see. Those decisions, you're not making those kind of decisions on the driving range. That's just rote, rote and rote, just repetition after repetition, but that's not the same kind of mind that you need in a practice round. And that is a reason why anxiety steps in when they step on the first tee, because now you see trees, you see the sand, you see water, you don't see a giant open space anymore. You see consequences and that's judgments. You have judged it perhaps even before you teed off. Judge it mean, if I hit it there, I can't do this. So you're judging it even before you tee off. That kind of prejudgment hooked on to a consequential actions, that can cause you great anxiety. The what ifs or the shoulds or the expectations, all of these things are psychological in nature. They have got nothing to do with the golf swing and yet they impact the golf swing. 
It's got nothing to do with swinging a club, and yet it's got everything to do with the outcome of swinging a club. And that is the reason why people on that level two, they cannot transition from the range to the golf course because they don't know how to think. They don't know what to think. Is it their own problem? Is it their own fault? I guess so. But if no one has ever told them that they need to send somebody like me, then I don't know whose fault is it. So many golf instructors are still, uh, they're very resistant when it comes to sports psychology. It's all simply voodoo. And that's the reason why most players that play on the web.com and the LPGA, the Smintra Tour, will not make it onto the, uh, on up to where they want to be because even on the level three, which I'll go into now, they don't have the right mindset. So now here we are in the level three. Now these are the expert players, the single digit handicap players, the, um, the professional golfers that are playing for money around the world. And so they, now they've, they're beyond rote memory now. They're still working on their game, still you know chugging away, hitting them balls every single day, working on their short game. Hopefully they're working on their short game. However, when they get to a practice round, lights out, right? But when they get into a tournament situation, the light stays on. And so you say, well, I, how is that possible that I can shoot 66 in a tournament round and shoot 72 or 75? If you shoot 75, it might as well be 95. It's the same score in a, on a PGA, on a regular PGA Tour event. Why can't they make that transition over a four-day period or a three-day period or whatever the, or the round is? Why? And the reason... There's a lot of reasons why, but most of the reason it's all in their mind. Because once you get to a level three player, the swing now is in procedural. The swing is procedural now. In other words, it's like riding a bicycle. You, you, you learn how to ride a bike as a kid. If you don't ride a bike again for 25 years, you can get on a bike and start riding it again. Why? It's because it's in procedural memory now. It's in long-term memory. It's been encoded onto them brain cells and you can pick up a bike and start riding it again. Can you ride it like when you were a 10 year old kid? No, but it won't take you long to make those adjustments and very soon you'll be riding it. Same thing with, with a professional golfer's swing. They have hit so many balls that it's not about hitting the ball anymore. It's about why am I hitting the ball? It's the why behind the what? The hitting the ball, that's already happened many, many years ago. They can hit any golf shot, right, left, left, right, high, low, whatever you want. Now it's becoming, why am I hitting this shot? And under what circumstance am I hitting this shot? This is all 100% psychological in nature. And because most professional golfers do not use a sports psychology consultant, just like Phil Mickelson said, you either got to be really smart or really dumb to be a great player. Most, and he said it himself, most players are in their own way. They're right there. They're not really smart and they're not really dumb. That's the majority of players that I have had experience with. They're right there in the mass majority of them right there. That's the 90%. The 5%, of course, you know, that's Mickelson, psychology degree, okay? And then you, Tom Watson, psychology degree. And then you got the real dumb, the real dumb players that, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, that seemed like a very cruel thing to say. But those are the players that have a real short memory. You know, good shot, bad shot, eh, same thing. It doesn't matter. They just hit the ball down the middle, hit the ball in the green, make a putt or two, and move on. The past means nothing to them. The future doesn't mean anything. They just stay in the now. And maybe they... You know, I hate to say that kind of language, but it was Mickelson that said it. Maybe they don't have it a, a, a super high 125 IQ like Phil Mickelson. But the 90% of the professional golfer are right there. They're in their own way. They don't trust themselves enough to hit this shot. They're afraid to hit this shot. They're wondering what will happen if they hit this shot. And the anxiety that they feel standing on a tee is, is just overwhelming for them in certain circumstances on a practice round no problem they can take it from the range of practice round, no problem but when they come from the practice round into the tournament round that's the third mind and that's where 
That's where most of them fall short. So in closing on this series, uh, I hope to be able to do some more in-depth and specific things and thoughts about golf psychology. In other words, like for example, the psychology of the golf grip or the psychology of the takeaway. I mean, there's a lot that goes on in the mind, even when you're gripping the club. There are, you know how many grips there are in this game? If you add in pressure points in the grip, I mean, yeah, you've got the old Varden grip there, sure, but there are players that will use a more grip in these three fingers to hit a certain shot. Or they'll simply rotate both hands, you know, if they have a semi-strong grip, they'll rotate both hands back to the left to weaken the grip to hit a particular shot. This is the psychology of the golf grip. And there are so many grips out there, three, four, five grips, I guess, you know, uh, and there's the psychology behind every single, there's a decision that is made behind the grips. I know that we don't think about it very often, but if you want to be a great player, you got to get real, real smart. And to get real, real smart, you got to look at everything, every little detail in your game. Just like what, Mick, Fickle, what Mickelson told Faraday, he knows everything about his game. He knows everything about his equipment. He knows everything about his club selection. And he knows everything about how far it, he's going to hit a ball. And he knows the probabilities as well. The probabilities that if he takes this swing on this particular shot with this particular club, how far is the ball going to go? How far is it going to roll? How far is the ball going to travel when it hits onto the green based on the lie and everything else? All of these things come in to make a decision, make an intelligent decision, and then he's able to execute that. So he knows, you know, this guy knows, and that is why he is Phil Mickelson. Why aren't you Phil Mickelson? Well, say, well, Dr. Trammell, you know, I, I just don't, you know, I just don't have the talent. Phil Mickelson is just a phenom golfer. Maybe, and that's possibly true. But my thinking is this. If you are a professional golfer and you're playing on, let's say, the web.com, look, look at the stats of what Phil Mickelson, a player like Mickelson does. Just look at his stats. Are you hitting as many fairways as Phil? You probably are. This guy's not the most accurate guy in the world. So it's not about fairways hit. You could be a better fairway player than Phil Mickelson. In other words, you could be hitting more fairways than him. Is he, maybe he's longer off the tee. Maybe, maybe that's what it is. He's just a long driver. No, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. If you're a professional player, if you're a professional golfer on tour, and let's say you're a male now, I'm just saying that, you know, to give you a reference, you're probably hitting it just as far as he is, maybe even further. So it's not the distance, see. And you have access to the same equipment that he does, so it's not the equipment. So we've ruled out those things. It's not the fairway. It's not the equipment, all right? So maybe he's hitting more greens than you. Maybe maybe he's a better iron player than you. No, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. Unless you are below the tour average, way below the tour average, which is, what, about 70%, maybe 68 or 69%. What is that, 11, 12 greens per round? If you're a professional golfer and you don't have the ability to hit 10, 11, or 12 greens per round, then you're wasting your time. Then you need to go back onto the number two, number two, get back onto the range. Maybe you need to go back to the one of how to, how to swing a golf club so that you can build consistency in your game. If you can't hit 11 to 12 greens per round in a tournament situation, I, I, then why are you playing professional golf? I mean, you have to at least get up to the tour average which I believe is around, isn't it about 11, 12 greens per round, something like that. That's what he's hitting. However, check out what he's doing on his wedge game inside 100 yards. Now, you have four wedges in your bag, just like Phil, maybe even more. Are you as accurate as Phil Mickelson in, inside 100 yards, 80 yards, 75 yards, and so forth? I mean, you can get all those tour averages now on the PGATour.com website. And if that's and if and if you're not accurate as accurate as, as Mickelson, then why aren't you? Why aren't you as accurate as a player like that? I mean, it doesn't take a, a, a huge amount of talent to hit a wedge if you're a professional golfer from 75 yards, hit it in there 10 feet. I mean, do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, are you a professional touring player or are you not? A professional touring player I and mean, this is what you do for a living so if you don't feel comfortable with your wedges 
then you, maybe you need to examine how you're practicing or, or what you are practicing. But this, these types of decisions are all mental, right? You, you, you may want to go back and work with your coach and say, coach, I need to hit, you know, if I got to hit a nine iron from 100 yards and get it in there with 10 feet, then I need to hit a nine. Whatever it takes, develop some of your feel or something like that. Or you need to hit a mul you need to be able to hit multiple shots into the same hole with different clubs. This is the kind of talent or development of talent that maybe you should look at. So if but if let's say you are, you can hit uh, within ten or fifteen feet from anywhere, you know, light rough to fairway with your wedges, then what's left? What is left? The putting, of course. You can hit, you know, I'm sure on the on your practice days when you're putting, you can knock 10 feet, 10 footer after 10 footer into the hole. I'm telling you, it comes down into your mind. It's got nothing to do with all of those things. You're a professional golfer. You get paid to hit a golf ball. It's got nothing to do with your striking the ball ability. It's got everything to do with your decision making. This is the whys behind the whats. It's, the, it's how you are talking to yourself when you leave the driving range and go on to the first tee, maybe you're thinking, I don't deserve to be here. I'm not that good. You teed up against Phil Mickelson, you shake his hand. How are you gonna feel? Are you gonna feel like I'm gonna bury this guy today? Or are you gonna feel like, I really don't deserve to be here around 10,000 people. I'm just not that good. I'm a developmental player. And I don't wanna humiliate myself out here. I'm not that good. Is that what you're thinking? If it is, then guess what? You're not that good. So my thing to you is that there are three golf minds. Where are you? And if you have the desire or the dream to take your game to another level, yes, you need to work with your swing coach to get, to get the rote memory down so that you don't have to think about it once you get on the golf course. And then once you transition from that, you go over to the practice round and you can lights out on the practice round, that hopefully will give you the confidence to say, look, I know this golf course, and now I can transition that into a tournament round. If you cannot transition it into a tournament, if you can't go from the driving range of a tournament and, and play the same that you have done in a practice round, then you've got some mental issues there. And I'm not talking mental issues in that you are mentally ill. I'm talking about the things that is that are involved in golf psychology, the decision making. Just like Norman said, it's the decisions that you're making and why are you making those decisions? If you have not explored those things in your game, I don't know how you're ever gonna make it because the smart players, the Mickelsons of the world, they are using people like me. They're out there right now talking to sports psychology consultants. And quite frankly, as I've given you my credentials, uh, I don't know of anyone else in the world that has my credentials, but it, it's not that's not 100% necessary. It's just that I have a very unique skill set, but it's not 100% necessary to have a person working with you that has those particular skill sets. It's just a matter of having a person that can understand where you're coming from as a professional athlete, what you want and the motivations behind your decisions. That's all it is. Bringing in a team of professionals to help you achieve your goal and understanding why you want to achieve your goal. That's all I'm saying. Most players are not utilizing all of the things that are available out there. And part of the reason is, is because they don't know what to work on or they have a misunderstanding of what sport psychology is. So there it is. There's my soapbox for the day. This is just one little thing that I may start doing in the future is talking a little bit more about the psychology of golf, the deep subjects of golf psychology. I've been asked to do this by some clients and some students at the great University of Alabama and University of Alabama at Birmingham. So I may start doing that and start making a video series about the specifics of golf psychology. So I hope you enjoyed that. And uh, if I can be of any service to you, please let me know. Thank you very much.